This next video series is on localized molecular orbital theory, and if molecular orbital theory is something that you've feared in the past, my hope is that this series of videos will help ease your frustrations a little bit and make you a little more familiar and a little more comfortable with molecular orbitals. We're going to begin by defining the concept of an orbital using three fundamental characteristics. There are three, and there are only three, really, things that you need to think about when dealing with orbitals. We're then going to see how we can combine atomic orbitals to create hybrid atomic orbitals, and combine the hybrids to create what are called localized molecular orbitals. Now these are a highly intuitive form of molecular orbitals that are just as valid as the orbitals you may have seen in introductory chemistry that are more visually complicated, and they're extremely intuitive for use with organic molecules. We're going to use these to make predictions of reactivity in a future lesson, and they give us great insight into molecular structure. The truth is that the Lewis model of bonding is actually pretty robust, and lo localized molecular orbital theory is built on this idea. So we're going to focus on molecules to which resonance isn't relevant at this point and deal with orbital theory outside of the context of resonance. When we talk about delocalized systems in a later lesson, we're going to bring resonance in in a way that's largely independent of everything we've already talked about. Let's begin by revisiting the concept of an orbital in general and discuss the atomic orbitals and hybridization. An orbital is just a function over space that describes the probability distribution of an electron. What this means is an orbital tells us where an electron is likely to be according to the rules of quantum mechanics. If you've been intimidated by orbitals in the past, I have good news for you. There are three and only three important properties that all orbitals have. These are the only three properties that we ever consider for any orbital. And this is the best way to think about orbitals is in terms of these three properties. And they answer the questions that are shown on this slide. The first is occupancy. How many electrons are located in the orbital? On an orbital energy diagram, which shows the energies of orbitals and actually highlights these properties, we identify occupancy as the number of electrons in an orbital represented as a horizontal line. And so, for example, this hypothetical orbital I'm drawing here has an occupancy of two. It has one spin up and one spin down electron. We also see orbitals with an occupancy of one that contain only one electron. And we also see so-called empty orbitals which are associated with an occupancy of zero. They have no electrons within them. The second important property of every orbital is its energy. And this is a really important property. We can identify energy by looking at the height of the orbital on the diagram because the y-axis in an orbital energy diagram represents energy. So for example, let's draw four levels here from highest to lowest energy, and I'll fill the bottom two levels because what energy tells us about an orbital depends to some extent on whether it's occupied or not. If the orbital is occupied, that is if it has electrons, the orbital's energy tells us about the stability of those electrons toward being donated or given to something else. And what we can say here is if we, for example, label A and B on this diagram, orbital B's electrons are more stable than orbital A's because they're lower in energy. The situation changes a little bit for empty orbitals. So if I label the empty orbitals shown here as C and D, an empty orbital wants to accept electrons. It has the ability to accept electrons. And generally, the lower an empty orbital is in energy, the more likely it is to accept electrons because those electrons would be more stable if they entered that orbital, right? Why would a pair of electrons enter orbital D when they could easily access orbital C at a more stable position instead? So for the empty orbitals, orbital D is actually the more stable of the two since it's less likely to accept electrons than orbital C. Orbital energy guides our thinking in determining the most important orbitals within a molecule. And while we'll have much more to say about this later, one thing to notice is that the least stable orbitals in this hypothetical set are C, the lowest unfilled orbital, and A, the highest filled orbital. More on that later. The final property we need to consider, which can be the most complicated visually, is called the shape. And the shape is simply the shape of the probability distribution function over space. Now this is a function of three dimensions, and so it's difficult to represent in space. The way we typically do this is on a picture of the molecule 
using blobs or lobes inside of which electrons are likely to reside if the orbital is filled or where electrons are likely to go for an unfilled orbital. So for example, we can imagine an orbital shape that maybe looks something like this with one lobe of one color above this hypothetical molecule and a lobe of another color below the hypothetical molecule. Inside of these lobes we're likely to find electrons and the colors represent the signs of the wave function. Now negative probability doesn't make sense but what the sign is important for is for combinations of orbitals. When we start overlapping them with each other the signs become important. And so although this color to sign convention is arbitrary we might represent the blue lobe as positive wave function and the red lobe as negative wave function. When we start combining orbitals you'll see that whether two lobes of like sign or opposite sign are overlapping is an important determinant of the shape of the orbital that comes out of the combination. Shapes also tell us about electron density. Larger lobes are associated with larger electron density at atoms near the lobes. 